Shove it, man! All right, Shove It Squad. Today's video is one I've been waiting to make for a while. These guys wrestled in every major US wrestling company throughout the 90s and 2000s, but today they're hardly talked about. And that's the sort of wrestler I like to focus on on this channel. And from what I've seen of them, their gimmick was pretty entertaining. And dare I say it, you can see the origins of John Cena in this gimmick. And if you're still not convinced, these guys were insane. Keep watching for this crazy story. All right, all right, PG-13, the best your girl's ever seen. So we've got two guys in this group. We've got JB Dundee and we've got Wolfie D. Whole lot of Ds in this group. They met up and started tagging in the early 90s for Jerry Lawler's USWA. The team known as PG-13 would be Wolfie D and Jamie Dundee who was going as JC Ice. And even more better known for his daddy being Bill Dundee. And let me tell you, this guy is New Jack territory of batshit insane. They had a successful time in Memphis, winning the tag belts more times than you've been laid. Not more times than Dundee's be laid though, going by the amount of kids he has. Lay him, don't pay him. Anyway, we're getting off subject here. They like to wrap and wear hubcaps around their necks for some reason. I think it was meant to be a joke at first, which kind of stuck. Their gimmick is... I guess ghetto white boys. They also enter to Here Comes the Hot Stepper, which leads to a lot of claims that the public enemy stole their gimmick in ECW. JC Ice does most of the talking on the mic and he has this unhinged promo style. This guy can end up saying anything on the microphone, that's what makes it really entertaining to me. JC Ice and Sir Wolfie D, we ain't playing no games, so you better beware. You don't like us, so what? We, we really, really don't, don't care. care. I'm 185 pound more bounce for the ounce. You got that punk, that's what counts. This is the wrestling world. Women shouldn't even be around. Now, wait a minute. We yeah. went all through this. This is right. the 90s. And women can get beat down like the punk that she is. There ain't nothing I like better than capping somebody, and you know what I mean by Capping somebody, my little sister, because I'm going to slap you around like the man that you are, my girl. These times in the USWA really remind me of Too Cool in the WWF. The way they dance between moves and also their attire. In fact, I think Grandmaster Sexy literally stole these dance moves. They have really good chemistry together. They just seem to be best friends and it makes it fun to watch. Not long after forming, the WWF copied the PG-13 gimmick and put it on Men on a Mission, Mo and Mabel. At the time, the USWA was used as a developmental territory for the WWF, and with PG-13 being the top tag team there, it was only inevitable that they would end up on WWF programming at some point. Now who's ready for the first punch to the gut of the video? They did get a shot in the WWF in 1995. One match was against Jobbers. McMahon on commentary had no idea who they were, and he still seemed confused even after they wrapped their introduction. Lawler really tried hard to put his PG-13 boys over. Then they had a tag title shot against the Smoking Guns, they looked as wacky as they come in this match, but still incredibly entertaining. Of course, they lost and then they'd be gone from the WWF. Wolfie D felt like this break in 1995 came about too soon for them because they were too small for the WWF at the time. So it's back to the USWA for them. They were supposed to come back to the WWF around Royal Rumble 1996 for a full-time role, but then it all went wrong when JC Ice partied too much. In fact, he partied too hard that he was still up drinking when he caught an episode of USWA and his partner was on the show and then he realised he was supposed to be on the show too. Lawler was so angered that he'd missed the show that he pulled them both from the Royal Rumble 1996. What a punch to the gut that is. Now we've had a punch to the gut, but how about a brick to the brain? You must surely all know about the Nation of Domination, one of the most popular factions of the Attitude Era. Well, I bet you didn't know that there was another version of the Nation of Domination running in the USWA. Along with PG-13, members that you may know were Jack Willen, Tracy Smothers who's going as Shaquille Ali, Mo from Men on a Mission, and this was before the Nation of Domination the WWF that you all knew and loved. They soon announced that they would be doing the bidding of Farouk. It's mind-blowing that the origins of such a popular faction are never mentioned. Now back onto some more WWF programming. As PG-13 were leading the nation down the USWA, it only made sense that they'd appear again soon on WWF TV. That time would come at Survivor Series 1996. PG-13 wrapped Farouk to the ring, and let me tell you, this thing was bad. The instrumental was changed at the last minute which threw off their rapping. You can see JC Ice looking confused and looking at Wolfie D for help. This almost felt like deliberate sabotage because this rap was an absolute car crash. They're in the middle of saying something and then it interrupts and saying, Nation of Domination. This somehow continued for a while though. I never really felt that the PG-13 rapping and hyping Farouk to the ring was actually a good fit. Farouk was so damn serious and these guys were nuts. This literally carried on for six months. PG-13 were just essentially bodies in the nation of domination the hype men for the ring entrance. During this run, PG-13 literally had one match in six months, despite both being experienced trained wrestlers. 
The nation randomly decided that PG-13 had to be sacrificed by having a match against the Legion of Doom. Of course the match was a complete squash, but it was a fun one. And this loss effectively kicked PG-13 out of the nation. Within a week or so, this version of the nation was ended by Farouk, so it wasn't as if PG-13 missed anything. Who's ready to make this a punch to the gut sandwich? PG-13 had their lyrics removed from the WWF CD for the nation's theme music, but overseas the WWF still sold the CD of the PG-13 audio on it, and PG-13 didn't receive a penny for this. Wolfie has since said he had absolutely no idea that his song was being used. It's not all negative though, at WrestleMania 13, PG-13 got to have their WrestleMania moment as they got a double doomsday device. Wolfie D was unfortunate enough to be on Ahmed Johnson's shoulders and he said this almost killed him. Now I bet you think so far it all seems like it's Jamie Dundee's fault. Well who's ready for another jab to the jaw? Wolfie D has since admitted that they spent the entire WrestleMania weekend smoking crack together. Now look who needs a smack. So you might think it was over for PG-13, but they immediately went to ECW and they'd be seen a little bit more regularly in the ring here. I bet JC Ice had a great time in the ECW locker room. They were able to let loose a little bit more on the mic, but they didn't exactly endear themselves to the ECW audience. Really funny spot in a tag match. After Mikey Whipwreck grabs Ice's nuts, he starts cutting a promo in a high-pitched voice. There's another reason I like this match though. It's because a wild slap nut sort of appears. Nah, I meant I've noticed PG-13 using a lot of Southern style taunting to annoy the North American audiences, and it works. They wrestled for the ECW tag titles on pay-per-view against the Dudleys, and Dundee got a pretty big spot on this show, running down all the Dudleys on the mic. He even got to hit on Jenna, who I'm sure a lot of you were a big fan of at this point, and who wasn't in 1997. But the point being, these unhinged promos were getting some crowd noise. You're so fat, if I told you to haul ass, you'd have to make two trips, fat boy. <laughs> Wolfie doesn't really say much still, maybe he's a mute. A fun match with the Dudleys, but they win with the 3D. That was pretty much all their involvement in ECW, they weren't main characters, despite being over with the crowd, they just had matches, they were there to put guys over. Nice that they got to show off a bit more wrestling skill though. They still competed down at their home during the ECW run anyway, but in late 1997 USWO would close their doors with PG-13 still being their tag team champions at the time. The territories were dying and PG-13 would need to find a new home. They'd outgrown the territory anyway, but it seemed like no one bigger would have them. Can't help but wonder if this was down to the crazy antics of Dundee. An entire year was spent in the wrestling wilderness, followed by about the only positive I could find at this time. It's that Wolfie D got to wrestle Kurt Ankle twice in Memphis before his WWF debut. He isn't able to claim a pinfall over the Olympic era though, unfortunately. What's interesting is PG-13 didn't team together for an entire year. I guess Wolfie had enough of his shit, but that was about to change. PG-13 debuted on WCW Thunder at the end of 1999. I'm surprised it took so long for them to appear in the Southern-based wrestling company. Their introduction rap was so awkward and met with booze from the crowd. I still liked it though for some reason, at least they're doing something. It's to the P, to the G, plus the one and the three. That means JC Ice and I'm Wolfie D. You don't like us, so what? We really don't care. And it was established straight away that they were here to be nothing more than a joke. The highlight was probably getting their asses kicked by DDP on his own and then getting beaten up by Nash and Steiner whilst Nash tried to pretend they were having a competitive match. I mean, if anyone was doubting that they were a joke, Dundee literally comes to the ring in a jester's hat. Despite nothing going on in this WCW run, they still somehow get to make their rapping entrance, but the music doesn't fit and it feels rushed. That's probably not their fault, let's be honest. Anyway, it was literally over in three months. They didn't win a single match other than the odd DQ win. And that, my little friends, is pretty much where the story ends. Well, for Jamie Dundee, JC Ice, that is. He just wrestled on the independence. He briefly had a gimmick where he was handcuffed before and after matches. He was the convict. Doubt that was even a gimmick. I know Jamie gets some hate on the internet for comments he's made in the past. He has said some truly disgusting things in shoot interviews. But from a purely wrestling perspective, he was absolutely nuts and I enjoyed watching him. He was a pretty small guy, but he just wasn't as athletic as some guys his size, so he had a larger than life personality instead. The highlight of Jamie's career came after wrestling when he appeared on the Jerry Springer show, along with his dad. The story wasn't over for Wolfie D though. He would bag himself a developmental deal with the WWF. He changed his name and his gimmick. He was now the Slash Man. He packed on about 50 pounds of muscle, added some tattoos and put in a fake eyeball. He looked like a completely different guy. Wolfie says to this day that people still don't realise that Wolfie and Slash were both played by him. This would be a pretty cool run for him because he'd be part of a faction known as the Disciples of Sin along with young Batista and Tyson Tomko. It was a pretty weird stable, a sort of Undertaker's ministry vibe to it. He also got to wrestle against future greats like Shelton Benjamin, Randy Orton and Brock Lesnar. 
It was a great time to be an OVW. Unfortunately, he never got further than a couple of matches on WWF C shows, but it was cool to see that he had also completely changed his moveset for the new character. The downside to being an OVW at this time was that he had less chance to stand out with so much talent on the show, so they eventually let him go. Just in time for him to sign for this new startup, which was TNA Wrestling. This guy got around more than your girl. There's no punchline, your girl's easy. Deal with it. And this would prove to be his best run in wrestling. He appeared on the very first episode of TNA. He was also placed in a gothic stable led by Father James Mitchell, the Disciples of the New Church. No relation to the OVW faction. And it was here that he won the NWA tag belts with his partner Brian Lee. They had a pretty nice feud game of America's Most Wanted. He didn't really get any mic time though, because that was what James Mitchell was for. As time went on, the team were pushed less and less. Brian Lee was replaced with Kazani. Honestly, it just felt like they just trotted the tag team out anytime they wanted to be used for some hardcore type matches. Slash was used regularly, but I wouldn't say he was used well. After nearly a two year stay of TNA, he called it a day. Now, according to Jamie Dundee, <laughs> someone had been stiffing Slash on his pay and he was owed quite a few dates. And the man that was stiffing him was a wild slap nuts appears. Jeff Jarrett. Dundee advised his friend Slash that he needed to threaten Slapnuts for the money that was owed to him, so Jeff then ended Slash's stay in TNA. Great work, Dundee. Slash spent the rest of his career on the Indies, occasionally teaming with his old partner Jamie Dundee as PG-13. One last moment to speak about is his random appearance at TNA Slammiversary 2022. He participated in the Reverse Battle Royal and it was a pretty cool throwback to see him again. Come to think of it, he was also on the show for Ric Flair's last match. Is Wolfie D trying to make a comeback? Probably not. I wouldn't be against one final TNA run for nostalgia though. Slash showed that throughout his career he wasn't afraid to take some bumps. He truly loved to make his opponents look as good as possible. Recently, this guy, a man who was not exactly stable. Jamie was still no-showing events as recently as this year and leaving his former partner to deal with the consequences. How this man dealt with Jamie Dundee over 30 years is beyond insane. I don't blame him for finally throwing in the towel. Now I like the team, I really did. I felt like they were ahead of their time. I could see bits of John Cena, Too Cool and the Acclaimed in their gimmick. The size of these men really affected their chances though, more Jamie Dundee. And their attitudes affected their chances, once again, more Jamie Dundee. I do think they deserved a bit of a shot somewhere, they never failed to entertain me at any point. They seemed to be working hard to have good presentation without backroom backing. They weren't just two random guys and that's what I liked about them. I hope you enjoyed this video, every so often I get an urge to do something like this. It's not all about the viewing figures, these kind of videos are true to myself, and that makes this worthwhile. And if you don't agree with that, I'll leave you in a mangled pile.